in some arbitrary body. Two, two, two. Two, two, two. Uh, where this is sigma x, sigma y, tau, uh, or sigma x, y. We can represent that state of stress uh, visually to kind of help us figure out what directions things are pointing in, where here we would have uh, sigma x, sigma x, y, you know, sigma y, sigma x, y, and this would form some sort of a circle. Now, with a center point, c, and a radius r that goes out to here. c is sigma x plus sigma y over 2, and my radius is the square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 sigma x y squared. Okay, so I wanted to run through a couple examples of this real quick just to make sure it's all nailed in. You should have been familiar with it from before, uh, from CE 220, but uh, I wanted to just make sure it's kind of sticking for everyone. So I'm going to switch over to a laptop. Let's see if it goes. I have it plugged in this time. So it should work. Let's get this thing going. It wants to start up. Okay, and while you're getting that open, uh, I have a really kind of a simple one. Uh, and I'm going to say what's what's the maximum shear stress and what's the what direction does that maximum shear stress take place in uh, for a sample that's being uniaxially compressed. I'll let you think about this for a sec. So here we have that angle theta, the and I'm looking for what that what that maximum value of tau is. All right. Hopefully that popped up now on your screens. So, I think the majority is picking that angle is at 45, tau m is at sigma over 2. I'm going to actually jump to another example first, and then we'll come back to this and we'll see if anybody has changed their mind. So, let me jump back to the doc cam. I'm going to look at another type of a simple example. This is going to be uh, pure shear, where I have a body some shear force tau on it and this is only acting and so Joe in this body I only have shear acting now if I wanted to draw my Moore circle for this oh let's not draw that there let's draw this in the center um, my two points that I'm going to plot so I have no Sigma X and no Sigma Y so that's a zero, and I have a tau here. So I have a point here, and then a point corresponding here. So I have a circle right around there. I know my center, sigma x plus sigma y over two is zero. So my center's here in the middle. And my radius now, uh, these are again both zero. The square root of sigma x y squared is tau. So this now has a radius tau. This now is, is tau. Oh. How did I? This point now is a minus tau. 
So uh, if I want to find out what angle this is at, remember that this space plots from, from the analysis that we had done the other day, this, plot, this space plots a 2 theta. So let's say I wanted to find the principal stresses in this, my, my sigma 1 here and my sigma 2 here, which are my principal stresses. Um, I can do this now. I can, I can go back to those transformation equations if I want to, that, that big long equation to say at some arbitrary theta, I have whatever stresses. This is a nice pictorial way of doing it. So I know I have some rotation 2 theta. I can see to get to my principal stress that 2 theta is 90 degrees, uh, which means my theta is 45 degrees. And so that's my, my maximum principal stress is right there. The actual value, sigma 1 and 2, are equal to my sigma mean plus or minus uh, my, the radius of this guy, which is then sigma 1 is just tau sigma 2 is minus tau. Here now, what this means is this shape, if I apply a pure shear to this structure, or to this, to this little block, this is kind of equivalent to saying I'm applying now at, a, at an angle of plus 45, which is where my sigma 1 is. So here I have a plus 45, 45 degrees. I have a shear stress tau, this is acting in both directions. And now, in my minus 45, I have a negative sigma acting. Minus tau. Or minus tau acting. Minus tau. So then these two, whoop, these two stress states are the same. Now, if I were to do, oh, uh, actually, uh, which way do I want to bounce this? Now, if I ah, sure, let's let's do the so so now for for pure tension. Do do do. I wanted to draw my Mohr circle out here, or sorry, pure compression. Da, da, da. <coughs> I have here no shear uh, and a negative sigma, so I have one point there. My I'm going to redraw this going the other way, because this is easier. I have, I think this is some minus sigma acting. I have a minus sigma here. My sigma y is a 0, and I have no shear stress acting there. And I have a circle kind of going around like this, with the center now at sigma over 2. Sigma over 2 is my center. Blah. Um, so jumping back to my, so from this now, if I wanted to find the maximum shear stress, the maximum shear stress is this point here. Mm -hmm. Graphically, or you, I guess, you can, you can plug it into these equations to find what your radius is, uh, which mm -hmm. should just be sigma over 2 here. And so my maximum shear stress now, if I were to jump back to my to this problem, what angle and what direction does this happen at? Which one of these is the correct one? Sorry, what was that? The it is still far. <laughs> cool. So, just for, for the handful of people that didn't think it was for, hopefully this kind of clarifies some of that confusion um, into how kind of a nice graphic way that you can be thinking about these sorts of problems. Uh, yesterday, too, I had shown... Da, da, da. So, for this pure shear problem, I pointed out, or I, I mentioned really briefly that these principal stresses represent the eigenvalues of the matrix of the of the stress tensor, and the direction that they occur in represent the principal or the eigenvectors. I, think I said that right. Um, to do a really quick analysis to show you that, so here, 
I have, let's do some eigenvector analysis. I have, again, for this, for this tau state, I have a stress sigma, which is equal to zero, tau to zero. I know that the direction that the principal stress is. So sigma one was plus tau, sigma two was minus tau. I know that the direction that those occurred at was 45 degrees, so, uh, or plus 45 degrees and minus 45 degrees. So vector at plus 45 degrees, I can just say is some vector one, one. <coughs> Here, the same at minus 45 degrees is equal to 1 minus 1. Uh, now, if you remember eigenvector analysis back from linear algebra, which maybe people do, eigenvector analysis, yay, nay, sort of. All right. Uh, so for our eigenvectors, we know that if we have some matrix, which I'm just going to call sigma here, minus some lambda i, where lambda is our constant, or is a constant, in this case lambda is our eigenvector, or eigen, sorry, eigenvalue, multiplied by some v, where v is an eigenvector, this should be equal to the zero matrix, or zero matrix, or zero, this should be equal to a zero vector um, of whatever size this matrix is. Um, in this case, we're going to be looking for a zero, zero. So uh, if I then do that analysis, my sigma minus, uh, here I have a tau i v is, I have if I subtract, do this for my sigma 1, uh, I have minus tau, 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 minus tau, do, do, do. Uh, this is now 1, 1, which if I multiply this vector out, gives me, or if I multiply this vector and matrix out, <coughs> gives me 0, 0, which confirms that this is an eigenvalue and this is an eigenvector. So, for more, sorry. For more complicated stress states, in three D, there there is an equivalent Mohr's circle, uh, which I was debating showing you, but I don't really like a, a, the three D the more three D Mohr's circle analysis, just because I feel like it's very belabored. When you get to more complex stress states, generally this is the sort of analysis you would do is. If you wanted to find out the principal stresses, you would just do an eigenvector eigenvalue analysis, uh, because mathematically it's a lot more, it's a lot simpler. It's maybe less pictorially nice. It's it's harder to visualize um, than than the the nice more circle picture, but it's it's mathematically a little bit cleaner. So, da da da. Um, all right. So, I can show another more circle example with a more complex stress state. Would anybody be interested in that? If not, we can just move on to the next topic, maybe by a show of hands, if more and more circle. Cool. Cool. Good. Uh, then I will not belabor more circle anymore. So the, our next subject is going to be Drain. Um, so, if you remember, the relationship between stress and strain is a constitutive relationship. So that's how those how strain weight is a material property. But stress and strain independently are are don't don't need any constitutive relationship. Stress is a force balance. Strain is a change in geometry. Um, actually. I feel like I might run out of time with this. Before we get into this, I'm going to show you guys a fun video.
So because your tension lab is this week, da, da, da. Uh, da, da, da. <coughs> I'm going to show you. So I had mentioned before that you can do molecular dynamics analysis to try to study the motion of atoms in, in how these things, in how metals deform. Um, and you can do a whole bunch of different finite analysis tricks. This is going to be an experiment with some corresponding molecular dynamic simulations on a platinum nanopillar. So this is, you see that there's a 500 nanometer scale bar here at the bottom. For reference, for those of you who aren't as familiar with tiny things, human hair is about 100 microns in diameter, um, which is also coincidentally about the thickness of a piece of paper. So the thickness of a piece of paper is about 100 microns, uh, standard computer paper, plus or minus. Uh, so this is 500 nanometers. The actual diameter of this is about 100, 150. So it's about 1,000 times thinner than the <coughs> thickness of a piece of paper. Uh, and it's going to be pulled in tension. You see that there's a notch here somewhere on the side, which is actually what they were testing. And this was done uh, by one of my former lab mates, Wendy Gu, who's now a professor at Stanford. So in tension, you can see that there's kind of a noisy stress-strain curve. This thing pulls and eventually breaks kind of near the notch, which is what you would expect. Oh. So now what they did is they ran kind of a series of molecular dynamic simulations, which when you get to that length scale, to, to around 100, 150 nanometers, it's on the order of where the atoms are. So an atom in a metal takes up about three-ish angstroms. So in one nanometer, there's about three atoms. So 100 nanometers, there's about 300 atoms across, which computationally is still a very expensive problem. So this was actually done at a supercomputing facility in Singapore. But um, yeah, and it takes a lot of, a lot of comp computational power. But what you can see here, hopefully, uh, is there's some of the grains actually in this in this platinum nanopillar? Uh, they're modeling the notch here, and then here what they're showing all these solid lines represent a grain boundary. So if you remember grain boundaries from before, uh, here they they create a grain boundary by looking for the space between uh, the space where there's the regions of the sample where there's more space between the atoms. So they look at the disordered region of the of the pillar to, to plot out a grain boundary, and everything that's ordered, they just kind of blank out. Uh, and what you'll see is, is dislocation starting to move through these. So uh, the dislocations you'll see, again, as, as solid lines kind of propagating through kind of like the grain boundaries, because that dislocation is a, is a disorder is in, in the material. So when they pull this, you can then, whoa, why did that cut off so fast? Let's try that again. You can see some of those dislocation lines shooting through. Uh, so like here, for example, there's, there's a dislocation that's kind of <coughs> shooting across that crane. Um, and you can see that they start to move right around when things start yielding. There's another visualization of it. It's a little bit slower. Here, this is showing you the stress. The red is the stress concentration in this thing. So again, when we talk about tension of, 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 of a material. We kind of pretend it's this nice uniform stress all the way throughout the material. And that's true-ish on a continuum scale. So when you, when you get way, way, way bigger than these grains. So remember, this is 100 nanometers in diameter. So super, super, super tiny. When you're doing something that's 10 millimeters, all of a sudden the size of these grains isn't as important. But here on a, on a nanometer length scale, these stress concentrations throughout the material are highly, highly non-uniform. And you see that actually the material will start to deform where these stress concentrations exist, which are largely between grains um, and kind of mitigated by the motion of dislocations. So dislocations kind of act to relieve some of those stress concentrations. That's the plasticity mechanism. See, ah, damn it. Why are these videos so short? They keep cutting off. So you see there, a lot of the deformation was happening near that notch, and you see this kind of plastic zone starting to form. Uh, there's another one, again, with a bigger notch, where, oh, why? Why are they cutting off so fast? You can see that there was a lot of dislocation motion here, 
let me rewind that and play it again, next to this crack, and that dislocation motion corresponds with plasticity, and then again, here's a shorter notch. Um, now, this is maybe more relevant for later on when we're doing stress concentrations, but it turns out that when your stress concentration, so st the stress concentration here, when you have this little notch in the side of the sample, uh, acts to increase the stress locally, but if the microstructure of your sample, say the grain boundary structure somewhere away from the notch, actually has a higher stress concentration, it can lead to failure away from that point. So here you see that the, the stress concentration here at this notch is actually lower than what it would be at, at some sort of a triple boundary here, and you actually get deformation occurring away from it. Damn it. You actually get more of the deformation occurring kind of up here and more of that dislocation motion happening up here. Okay, so hopefully that was kind of a fun digression. This is sort of the thing that I want you to be thinking about in your labs, about how this microstructure of the material affects the properties, uh, and about what's actually happening at very small length scales with the types of tension experiments you're going to be doing for engineering tension experiments. We kind of ignore all of this, so this is a very a difficult and uh, B computationally expensive sort of thing to do, but it's kind of what you should have in mind when you're going through these 10 tests, is what's happening in the material isn't this nice clean deformation, but there's a whole lot of stuff going on internally in material. All right. So, let's jump back to material. Strain. So, here now, if you remember I drew my stressed potato where I had a potato that had forces acting on it in random directions. Now I can draw a strain potato where I have some potato body initially. Uh, let's define some point B. Let's say that there's some line going through it. Uh, and let's say this is in some all the points are in some reference uh, reference direction or reference point. All the, the body is defined by, by the set of reference points x. This now we're going to define a coordinate system here x, y, z. <coughs> and here I have some vector pointing to all these points. Uh, now I'm going to take this body and I'm going to deform it to some other shape. Maybe I'm, I'm stretching it, maybe I'm twisting it, maybe I'm shearing it. This deformation is highly non-local. Um, ah, damn. B, screw it. A, uh, the lines that were originally straight may have become curved, maybe it may have become curved, and this is now the motion of these is defined by some u of x. We're now do to do. I have all of my points B translating over to some other points. In a reference configuration, there may be rigid body motion, there may be rigid body rotation, and in the body itself, there may be stretches, there may be twists, and that could all be happening non-uniformly throughout sample. So this U represents the relative motion of the points in X. So from this, in this body, we can generally define some sort of a strain which to mimic how we had written our stress before, I can call this a sigma xx, or sigma, epsilon, epsilon xx, epsilon xy, epsilon xz, yy, yz. Now, 
I'm going to say kind of off the bat that this strain has to be, yes, that this strain has to be symmetric based on its relationship to stress, which we know has to be symmetric to preserve angular momentum. If, this, if the stress isn't symmetric, then the body will spin. Uh, similarly, if we have a body in static equilibrium, the strain will be symmetric. Um, but how do we actually get to this strain value? How do we get this strain from the relative motion of our body here? So I'm going to pull back to a simpler example. Let's say now uniaxial tension. So if I start off with a beam that I'm going to pull Uh, let's say, ah, I don't want to do this. This originally has some coordinate axis x and some original length l naught. Let's say this is our zero point, and I want to stretch that body out now. This is still at the same coordinate axis x with a point here zero, a reference point there l. Now I say my, my body has stretched. So I'm taking it, I'm not giving it any rigid body motion, I'm just I'm just uniaxially stretching it out like this. So the motion here now of my U, so my my U is only going to be a U of X um, of the values of X, because I'm only considering one direction. I can say, I'm going to assume right now that this is a linear deformation. Everything is deforming linearly throughout the body. This is just going to be some linear mx plus b. Now I know my u of 0 stays at 0. So all the points that start at 0 end up at 0. My u at l naught. So this is m times 0 plus b, so then b is equal to 0. All my points at l naught have moved to a new point l, maybe from an initial point l naught. So they've moved a distance. Now, this is where, maybe an important clarification, this is, this is the distance that all these points are moving. This has moved a distance l minus l naught. So it's moved from my point l naught to l. This is equal to m tie l naught. So then I can say my m is equal to l minus l naught over l naught. Now I see that uh, u of x is equal to l minus l naught over l naught x, which you should be able to recognize as the strain component for uniaxial stress. I can then say epsilon x is the derivative of u with respect to x, which is equal to l minus l naught for l naught. So this is a very simple example, and we see that just from this, this is the derivative here. Uh, let's think about a different type of example now. Let's look at rigid body motion. So, if I start off with a body originally at some point, one, one, two, three, two, and then I move it over to some new coordinate here. Now I have my u. Uh, I actually have to start considering the vector components of this. My x components now are just moving over all the points that start at any given point x. 
have moved over 2. All the points that start at any component y have moved up 1. So my relative motion of this body is just a constant here. We know that for relative body motion, or for, for rigid relative body, for rigid body motion, there should be no strain in the system. This this hasn't stretched at all in moving from point A to B. So I can now, using that same relation, du as I had used before, du dx, um, x is equal to zero for epsilon x, uh, du y dy is equal to zero for epsilon y. So this is kind of a nice check. By, by taking the derivatives of this u here, I can say that that's my epsilon x. So, so far this, this idea of taking derivatives of my u has worked reasonably well. Um, let's look at shear now. So, shear, uh, I'm going to call this, damn, simple shear. I'm going to start off with some body originally in this shape. I'm going to deform it out by some angle gamma here. This is now my x and my y. My u of x I can say no matter what point they started in in x, they don't actually. It's not actually dependent on x where they move, but what relative point they started in y actually does change where they move. So now the amount that they're moving over here is going to be dependent on y tangent of gamma. Uh, and in y, they're not actually moving at all. So here my y is zero. So now what I'm looking for. This is this is a body in pure shear. Um, I'm going to say this is approximately equal to y <coughs> gamma for small strains. Um, is that a familiar identity for people? Sine of x is approximately equal to x for small x yeah small angle theorem cosine of x is approximately equal to 1 small x and so tangent kind of by that same small angle theorem is equal to tangent of gamma is equal to gamma okay um, so now previously I had been taking derivatives of this guy so now I have in my u x, if I tried taking a derivative with x, I get zero, which is good because that means my epsilon my epsilon x, the same one that I had used before, was zero. If I now instead try taking a derivative with y, I get a gamma. But then if I do it for my other direction, du y dx, if I try taking these opposite derivatives, I end up with zero which means that if I were to look now at my strain tensor, I would have something like this. But what's wrong with that? Yeah, that's not symmetric. So this something went wrong along here. So, so far this idea of taking the, the gradient of the shape change of, of uh, or gradient of the, the relative motion had been working for getting me to my to my strain, but all of a sudden for this simple shear case we're not working correctly. So let's take a couple steps back. And I'm gonna define something that I'm gonna call a deformation gradient. For this deformation gradient, I'm going to call this f is equal to the gradient of u plus some i, 
which if I write out in matrix form is 1 plus dux dx dux dy dux dz dy dx duz dx go all the way down 1 plus du y dy du z dy y z and 1 plus du z dz so what this deformation gradient represents is basically the amount that I'm stretching a body in a given direction. So here you see this, this du x dy, which had given me my gamma on the simple shear case. Here there's a du x dx, which for uniaxial tension would be the, the strain, but I'm adding a one here. And so what that means, what I'm trying to do, oh, right, just those of you who don't remember, this is my gradient operator, which is d dx, d dy, d dz. Also, uh, just to double check, when I'm writing this kind of squiggly d, you should all recognize that that's the partial derivative. Just to double check, yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, all right. So, what I'm trying to do in defining this deformation gradient is, is define the relative stretch of a body. So if I start off with no motion or stretch, if I just have a body that's kind of sitting there, that's why my F, um, there's a Z component too. Eh. All right, kind of ugly. Uh, my deformation gradient F would just be one. So the relative stretch of this body is, is just the identity matrix. If I then wanted to apply a simple shear, or let's say stretch, if I wanted to stretch this guy, let's say these all started at one, and this ended up at two and a half, um, and still Uh, and still a one out here. My F is the deformation gradient there. Uh, it would now be a oh, X, Y, Z. This is equal to two, one and a half, one and zeros. So this would be a, a stretch and maybe a dilation in one direction. Really this should probably also be dilating in the other direction, but we'll say this is some weird metamaterial that doesn't stretch in that direction. Um, if I then wanted to go simple shear, uh, I'm going to do this in 2D now because I don't want to draw 3D. This is some gamma with my points 1 and 1 still. Then my F is equal to 1, gamma, 0, 1. So here I have that, that gamma. And I'm allowing this F to be non symmetric. So Da, da, da. 
connect it up. Oh, this is my thing. Okay. So, I can then use this f in constructing a strain. So, I'm now going to define a deformation gradient, or a, 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 a finite strain using my deformation gradient. Finite strain. I'm going to call this sum E is equal to F transpose F. So this F transpose F now makes this symmetric minus I. Because for my strain, I don't want if, I, if it's not moving in any direction, I don't want that one to be there, so I'm going to get rid of this identity matrix. So this F transpose F makes it symmetric, and this I gets rid of the, the no stretch condition. So writing this all out, oh, uh, half. I am forgetting a half in there. Sorry. Um, Writing this all out, if I were to multiply these out, remember my my f is the gradient of u plus i. Uh, if I were to do some uh, arithmetic and multiply these things out, I would get this is the gradient of u plus the gradient of u transpose plus the gradient of u transpose gradient of u. And so this is my full finite strain tensor. Now this would be symmetric. You see I'm adding the this and its transverse. So here this, this part is symmetric. Uh, and here when I'm multiplying a matrix by its transverse, this also ends up being symmetric. So here I have, I have a symmetric finite strain tensor. But this is a little bit complicated. And so this term will end up giving me some nonlinear behavior in there. And for large strains, uh, uh, for large strains, I, I kind of want to ignore it. So I can say this gradient of u is something on the order of epsilon. This is something on the order of epsilon. And this is something on the order of an epsilon squared, because I'm multiplying these two together. So what instead I can do, or what I can do is for small deformations, I can ignore the thing that's on the order of epsilon squared, and I get what's known as my infinitesimal And I do that basically just by ignoring this higher order term in my finite strain tensor. Here I can say my epsilon now is one half gradient of u plus gradient of u transpose. Now, does this look familiar, hopefully? No? No. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, so most of our oh, uh, that bell's gonna ring in like two seconds on me. Um, I don't want to do this. Okay. So tomorrow we'll go through some examples on this infinitesimal strain tensor. I'll actually write everything out. But this is kind of important to know. Most of the time you won't. All right, guys. Most of the time you won't actually be using this, this finite strain tensor, and analytically it very rarely comes up. But in finite element softwares, which is where most of this analysis will happen, sometimes there's a button to check that says nonlinear analysis, where you do large strain. That's actually using this finite strain tensor. So what most software finite element programs are doing is they're taking this deformation gradient because this is a very this is a very ger general definition for shape change. They're then 
throwing it into some into some constitutive law. So they're saying, okay, if I have some deformation f, and then this relates to how the stress is going to develop. If it's deforming finitely, I'm going to use this formulation. If it's a small deformation, I'm going to use this formulation, and it pops out a stress. This f is always kind of hidden from you, but this is sort of the basis of how all those finite element softwares work. Um, and this is what you'll, what all the large strain finite element solvers will use. So um, I'll stop there, and then we'll talk about this more tomorrow. Good luck with the labs.